and ways of making it a living system that evolves based on the measurements. So thank you all again. Thank you very much. And to maximize the time for anybody in the audience to make a comment, raise a question, uh, we should, we're going to not break and move right into public comments. And so there is a roving microphone. Um, somebody, who has the mic? Can I see who has the microphone? Okay. Can you, so people don't have to crawl over each other? I can't hear you. Yeah. And if, if you would keep, keep your comments brief, I would be very appreciative because if you don't, I'm afraid I have to m make time for others. So He's going to keep the timer? What you say? Oh, you mean to move it up? Uh, so, okay. Just give us one moment, please. Uh, yeah, I think they are. It's a good idea. Yeah. I had heard. What is it, two minutes? One and a half minutes. Okay. We've been timing, keeping all of our speakers to time, too, and that's the apparatus. Pardon? Um, if I can clarify, we had a number of people who asked to speak, and we had a public sign-in at the front table as we communicated throughout the past few weeks with people who asked to speak. Consequently, to all of you wonderful people in line, I am sorry to say I'm going to go in order of this list. So everybody could actually just sit down, please, and I will call the list, and I will bring this to you, okay? Thank you so much. Please, um, Val, Val, start. And I ask each person after Val calls you and you come up, if you could just introduce yourself to us, we would be very appreciative of that. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so the first person I have is Michael S. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michael Shaneyfeld. I'm from uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, um, uh, the question that I brought to the board is that uh, in 2000 I was approached by an ex-Navy sub-diver, uh, and uh, he brought to my attention the use of an auditory weapon that he stole from the United States Navy. Yeah. He told me about this weapon that he stole from the Navy, and he told me how the weapon would affect the central nervous system of a human. And he wanted me to go out and assist him in certain things. And in 2006, I, my life changed. I started, I woke up one night and I got a strong electrical shock in the center of my chest. From that, I started uh, to have problems with my heart. I started having by Jiminy's, irregular rhythms. Went in and uh, to the hospital. The doctors determined that I was getting electrical shock through the, uh, my chest. Then... I went in and had an operation done, oblation. And all this is just keeps going on. From then, it went to my lungs. Then from there, it went to my kidneys. From there, it went to my bladder. From there, it went to my colon. And it keeps going on and on and on. Medically, I've been looked at and reviewed over and over and over again. My brother, he's a doctor. My sister, she's a nurse. My nephew's a nurse. And I've, I've got people that have talked to me about medical situations and medical views. And I know exactly what's occurring is wrong, and I feel like I'm a test subject. And I've uh, responded to the government, and the government responded back to me. But I have not seen no action. I've given you all a report, and you all can look at the letters that I've sent in. Charles Chats. Charles Chats. 
Thank you. My name is Gerald Schatz, and I'm a lawyer and retired uh, professor of uh, assistant professor of uh, ethics and law at Michigan State University. I want to address two things very quickly. One is the theme of vulnerability and its recognition. We have gone from an era of very reflective and I think very decent uh, recognition of the moral obligations of researchers to an era of discussion of regulatory burden. I think that's unseemly. The second point is that there is law out there. The bioethics community has been oblivious to it, but there is international law. There is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the United States ratified in 1992, and it makes informed consent an absolute requirement, no exceptions, not even in emergencies, subject to those normal legal fictions of consenting for the incapacitated patient to medical care and so forth. Uh, additionally, the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions make uh, research very, very difficult uh, or prohibited altogether for those individuals who are caught up in war and armed conflicts. Michigan State University faculty responded to the OHARP request for comment uh, in 2005 on equivalent protections. I will be pleased to provide that comment and those citations and some additional materials to the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sina Ryan. Thank you very much. My name is Sina Ryan. I am an Iranian-American. been living here since 1976. To answer the question to the chair lady that if it's still going to happen or it's still going on, I will assure you that it's still experimentation going on and one of life is standing right here. I strongly believe that I have been targeted for the experimentation of a brain research since September 2008. Without my consent, they are controlling my mind and using electronic remote control device to send instruction to send instruction. In the past two and a half years, I have been subjected to constant electric shock, a sleep disturbance, a sleep deprivation, short but severe localized pain in my very, uh, into various parts of my body, telephone and bell rings in my ears, heat waves through my body, horrifying dreams, creating sudden fear and, worry and worries in my mind. They do these mostly when I am inside my apartment, but sometimes all this happens, some of this happens when I'm outside without I'm seeing anybody or any device. This experimentation are done to me without any touch or anything, any, any, see anybody. This inhuman and painful method of torture include reading my, my thought and memories. Through this, they have, they have been able to control me and subject me to severe pain that I have been suffering for the past 29 months. My health has deteriorated during this time and I have no medical insurance to seek medical help. My life is in danger and I need your help. From, from the government. I am, I am only asking them to stop this painful torture and leave me alone so I can go back to my life. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. John Hall. My name is Dr. John Hall. I'm a medical doctor from Texas. Um, as I understand the program of the president, it's for you to determine if current legislation is adequate in uh, protecting individuals as is ongoing experimentation. Uh, in reviewing the common rule 
uh, it's very obvious that there's a lot of loopholes to informed consent. All of the horrific experiments you've mentioned, uh, Willowbrook, MK Ultra, radiation experiments, mostly were done without informed consent. Uh, they were funded by the DOD and intelligence agencies, where I'm not even so sure you would know if there's an IRB, much less if an IRB is looking at informed consent. Um, as a physician, um, relative to some of what you're hearing today um, in the community, we are seeing an alarming rate of complaints of use of electromagnetic weapons, uh, microwave auditory effects, silent sound spectrum, EEG cloning, which has taken the lab out of the laboratory and into the home. Most of these, from the research that we reviewed, can be done remotely. Uh, it seems to be more weapons research than medical research. Um, I've personally corresponded with upwards of 1,500 victims all complaining of identical complaints from every state in the nation. Um, of being exposed to electromagnetic radiation, um, non-ionizing radiation for the use of cognitive control or behavior control. Um, I've submitted a, a paper to you, and there's a, another paper submitted to each member from another physician in Kansas City um, alluding to the same thing. Thank you. Mrs. Hall. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Millicent Black. Oh, madam. My name is Millicent Black. I'm from Tennessee. Possibly a transgenerational uh, person whose family members have been used for at least three generations, and I'm the second, uh, second one. My dad possibly was the first one who was admitted to a uh, Nashville hospital with a pineal gland tumor uh, left there with a plate in the back of his head, not the front of his head where his pineal gland would have been. Uh, at his death, I sought, well, actually before his death, I sought legal counsel for some horrendous treatment he had received at a nursing home that was also partnering with that uh, hospital in Nashville, only to find out that a judge told the attorneys to drop that case. Um, I am a part of the group that's here today representing those who are receiving the electromagnetic torture um, and even my daughter at five months old was referred to that same Nashville hospital after having been refused treatment at the local hospital. I believe she is also a victim of the electromagnetic torture. Where does it stop? When are we we given our rights as humans and as citizens. Does being African Americans qualify us as non-black or non-white and non-American citizens or non-American people? We seem to have a double bind going. Thank you. Mr. Marshall? Or Mrs. Marshall? Good afternoon. My name is Connie Marshall. I'm a former mayoral candidate from Louisville, Kentucky. I have never been involved in any criminal activity. I found a document in my bank account that said, problem with Kentucky government, check federal government paperwork and file before releasing information to anyone. I am an eight-year victim survivor of assaults by directed energy weapons. The torture I've experienced consists of body overheating, body extremely cold, seizures, heart pain, ear aches, itching behind eyes, burning behind eyes, swelling, headaches, involuntary movement of my limbs, exhaustion, speeding and heart racing, hair coming out by the handfuls as if I've had chemotherapy, mind paralysis, being hypnotized or placed in a trance-type state, being tracked by a drone or satellite, controlled dreams, sleep deprivation, B2K, which is voice to skull, projected sound, extreme muscle spasms, and extreme muscle cramps, being made to fall down, blue circles around the pupils of my eyes, and I'm here and you can look at them if you like, low frequency noises in my home, high frequency noises in my home, sexual stimulation, numerous electrical appliances in my home are destroyed, four computers, two fax machines, seven telephones, four CD players, VCR, DVD players, electrical igniter switch on my furnace, washer and dryer, air conditioner, also my car radio, CD player, and engine were destroyed. I am watched in my home 24 hours a day and followed, followed around everywhere I go, though I do not have a criminal history. 
When I ran for mayor of my town, I was also attacked at debates and forums. My website is www.justiceforallcitizens.com. Thank you. And I would like to leave these flyers with you all as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Allen Hornsblum. My name's Alan Hornblum. I'm a Philadelphia-based author who has written books on things running the gamut from organized crime to Soviet espionage. Uh, but for the purposes of this meeting, I've written two books on the history of using prison inmates as test subjects. You may be familiar with one or both of them. I'm working with a couple colleagues now on the history of using institutionalized children as test subjects for research, and I can assure you some of the material I'm finding is quite astounding, including the fact that Nobel Prize winners went to uh, institutions for the feeble-minded to use them as test subjects. And in interviewing people over the years, not just test subjects, which I do on a regular basis, but also the doctors who initiated these uh, experiments, these clinical trials, uh, I'm talking about people like Konstantin Melektos and Albert Kligman and Hilary Kroprowski, Chester Southam, some of the top researchers of the 20th century. Most of them are famous and some are infamous. It's remarkable that almost all of them articulate how little medical ethics was taught in medical schools at the time. And I had to bring up, uh, I, I had to educate one of them, in fact, about the Nuremberg Code. When I mentioned it, he wasn't even familiar with it. These problems with regard to medical ethics are still there. I periodically give talks at universities and med schools, and uh, it's, it's stunning to me that when I go into a bookstore at the university and go in, maybe I'll see one of my books there. Of course, I'm a little bit uh, disturbed when they don't, but I also don't see anything by Harriet Washington or by James Jones' Bad Blood or by Jonathan Moreno's book, Medical ethics is an orphan in today's medical arena. It is out there in left field. They really de-emphasize it, and that's part of the continuing problem that doctors, as, as Dan said earlier when they do these studies, it's a cost-benefit analysis, and there's much more benefit to doing research, even when it breaks rules and laws and cuts corners, than by following the rules. And that's why I believe the commission has to make a very strong condemnation of Dr. Cutler and the institutions and doctors that he worked with, not just with regard to uh, Tuskegee and Guatemala, but there are so many other incidents and events out there. As Susan said, we will continue to discover these. There will be another commission like yours in 10 years going over what you didn't look at or what you didn't do. So I would encourage you to be as aggressive as possible, not just describe what happened, but really condemn those who broke the law because there's doctors making decisions right now, and those decisions are going the wrong way. Thank you. Thank you.